Okay. Um, let me know. Can is this visible? Yes. Cool. All right. Um, so today I'm basically going to be going over using Git in a more advanced way. Um, I've actually given a, a talk on Uncubed previously about just initial setup and configuration of Git on your computer. And this will go a little bit deeper into that and how you can apply what you've learned on using Git to your teamwork or open source projects and how to navigate those open source projects like through GitHub, for example. Okay. So I'll just start off with a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Stuart. I'm an alumni of CUNY. I uh, graduated from the Bronx Community College and College of Staten Island with the Bachelor of um, Computer Science. And I have experience. Um, after graduating the College of Staten Island, I was offered a full-time position at JP Morgan doing some full stack development, primarily using a lot of React, uh, Java, and Python at JP Morgan. Um, after JP Morgan, I left on to go and work on um, at American Express as an Android developer, where I primarily work with Java still and Kotlin. Kotlin is pretty much the go-to language for um, Android development nowadays. So that's pretty much what I work with. And I'm just going to go over a quick rundown of everything I'll be going over today. So just giving a, a brief overview of open source, you know, what it means and, you know, what, how can, how does it relate to the student? And uh, I'll be going over how to clone a Git repository. I'll go over using the Git workflow and advanced Git commands and terminology. Um, and also I'll be going over navigating GitHub and creating pull requests and creating issues within GitHub. Um, so I don't think I have a chat window. Is, um, are attendees able to communicate with me? I just want to get an idea of um, how many people are familiar with or have exposure to GitHub previously. Yep, so uh, someone actually just came in to do a chat test. So we are all set. We do have a chat going. Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, <laughs> I see it. Um, so yeah. Okay, one sec. Cool. All right. So, um, so why does this matter? Um, basically, why does participating in open source and using Git at all matter to, you know, someone that's either graduating or entering the job market and um, trying to get exposure to more code and more experience. So it matters because it'll help you be more prepared to enter the job market. You'll become more marketable um, to prospective employers that are looking to hire students, especially if you're just graduating. Um, and I believe what the school year just ended, right? So congratulations to anyone that may be graduating or know anyone that may be graduating. Um, uh, another reason why this matters, um, you will understand the various ways to navigate code in unfamiliar projects. And you will have an idea of how to streamline work between team members and teams in general. So that could be either class projects, hackathons, your job, uh, most importantly, your job, <laughs> because, um, you know, if you're graduating, uh, if you're working on a job and you're new to a team, trying to get a handle on the code base and how, where things fit, you know, um, knowing how to navigate that, where most likely you'll be using Git um, will be of um, importance. You'll learn standards from other code bases and understand how code is working. So that's the main idea behind why Git, why open source is important. So you learn different standards, you learn how other people write code. You can learn a lot of things from open source. 
and I'll go into um, some of open, uh, an overview of open source. So I, I kind of pulled this definition off of Wikipedia, basically, is um, open source refers to a computer program in which the source code is available to the general public for use, including commercial purposes or modification from its original design. So <clears throat> when you're using, when you're interacting with open source programs, you get insight into your code. So if you're working on a team project and you want to open source your code, other people can have insight into how your code works and what can be improved or maybe even learn from what you're doing. Um, open sourcing also improves coding standards. So as most people may be familiar with JavaScript, which is actually a, um, is basically a rule set is, you know, technically it's a language, but it's a rule set applied to the language um, itself called ECMA script, which you've probably heard of like ES6, ES7, um, things like that. So um, it improves coding standards. It helps keep code uh, congruent and keep all sorts of developers on the same page. It improves code security and durability, specifically with testing and um, allow others to add features and open source also helps others learn. So like I said, um, if you open source code, anyone can take a look at it and other people can learn, like maybe a student who's graduating or still learning CS, you know, can peek into the code base of some popular framework or program that they're using and learn from it. Um, here's some examples of open source um, programs and languages and et cetera. So some of these things, most people are probably not aware of that are open source and you know, some people are, not, are aware. So there's, you know, MySQL, TypeScript, React, VS Code, Android, um, Chromium. There's pretty much, I would say like what, 75% of browsers out on the market now is, is Chromium based. So that's pretty um, interesting to, to um, know. I think so. Uh, there's Linux, Node.js, all these, all different types of programs are, are um, open source. Um, I just listed a few that I, I thought were pretty common and hopefully somewhat relatable to some of the students that are kind of learning um, in school right now. So um, any questions point about open source, um, you know, anything of that I went over so far and you can let me know chat. at any point in time, if you have a question, um, you can type in the chat and, you know, I'll read it and um, answer it to the best of my ability. So, um, so to kind of um, go over, um, to, to kind of get started on, you know, this um, open sourcing endeavor we're about to go through, um, you kind of have to know the basics of Git. Now, as I mentioned before, um, I pretty much went over this in the previous video. And with this video, I'm just basically going to assume that um, students may already know how to configure or have Git configured on a computer. If not, um, you'll probably get some context clues on how to do that throughout this video. Um, but for the most part, if you know these Git commands or have experience with some GUI um, using Git, then um, it'll be a little bit more smooth sailing. Um, so, you know, learning how to use Git status using Git add, um, push and pull. I'm a, I put some asterisks next to that because that's gonna be um, gone over in this video actually. Uh, commits and using logs, Git logs for um, doing the Git history. So if you know these commands, you're pretty, um, pretty good as far as um, what's gonna take place next. Um, so I will kind of go over now, um, Git workflow. So Git workflow is basically a standard um, as with uh, many things with massive teammates, uh, massive amounts of teammates and um, different people that you may come in contact, standards are very good to um, have. 
Um, if you have experience with JavaScript, I would say standards are pretty much mandatory because uh, JavaScript is a very lawless language. Um, <laughs> so basically, Git workflow structured, um, creates a structured way to coordinate project updates between multiple team members. Uses, it uses feature branches to keep intermediate work separate from semi-working or cleanish code. Um, there are, features are added to the main repository with pull requests. Um, release branches are cut to preserve major feature sets or releases and allow hot fixes to be applied. So there's some terms in here that um, some, uh, most students probably won't be familiar with, such as you know, feature branches, pull requests, uh, you know, release branches. Maybe you don't even know what a branch is. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go over that actually. Um, next. Um, and again, if um, at any point in time there's a question, uh, don't hesitate to send that in the chat and, you know, I will do my best to answer. So to kind of visualize or conceptualize what um, a Git workflow is, um, I don't know if this is small, actually, you know what, I'm going to take this online. Okay. Cool. So I, I just created a graph uh, basically of Git workflow and um, hopefully I'll help you conceptualize better than a slide will. Um, so basically if you take a look at any repository on GitHub or you know, if you're familiar with the Git repository on your own computer, um, there's a master branch most likely and there will be a develop branch that will be branched off of develop. So branches are, you can think of as timelines. Timelines is different parts of your um, code. Um, um, actually, to, to, I'll give a, a good example um, outside of code. So if you're kind of still confused in, in um, you know, where branches are, um, hopefully, painting this picture will help. So recently I um, been watching a lot of Netflix as I'm pretty sure most people have recently. And um, I've been watching a show called Hoarders. Um, so with Hoarders, you know, uh, there are people that like to hoard, <laughs> hoard stuff in their houses and then it becomes a massive task to um, clean out their houses. And there are a whole different, a whole lot of moving parts to um, cleaning someone's house that, you know, is, is um, drastically hoarded and has stuff all over the place. So if you think of um, uh, a hoarded house that needs to be cleaned as a Git repository, right? That's a project. Um, that would be the master branch. Um, so you just have this idea, all right, we need to get this house clean. We need to get this stuff organized, donated, or, you know, um, moved to wherever, I don't know. Um, cleaned, thrown in the trash. Um, so all those parts take place throughout the whole project of getting this house clean. That would be the master branch. So um, in order to create a new branch, so usually when the show starts, there's a psychologist that comes in. She'll take one part of the this cleaning process and address that to the hoarder as, you know, project. So you have to address the hoarder itself. She'll probably create um, the um, develop branch as say, all right, we have a house that needs to be clean. Let's branch off of this house, break it down to smaller pieces. So that's when that develop branch will come. They'll start interviewing the hoarder and their family members, yada, 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 and things like that. So, um, and once they have those interviews, then eventually it comes time to when they need to start cleaning the house altogether. And that would create other branches. So an organizer may come in and a junk cleaning crew may come in. They will also create branches in that timeline, this master timeline of cleaning the house. So, you know, the, the cleaners come in, they create their branch, they start working, they start organizing or donating, various things around the house. And all the while, the psychologist and hoarder will be 
doing what they do in their part, um, either delegating work or the psychologist would be talking to the hoarder. Um, all at the same time, these cleaners are moving in and out the house and et cetera. And eventually they will come to a point where, where they would create a, uh, uh, it'll, it'll become to the end of the day. So it's usually a multi day project because um, I believe, you know, most hordes won't take one day to finish. So, you know, one day we could call this like a release day, a release uh, commit. <laughs> Um, to, to kind of bring it back to the technical um, example. So a day ends, a release is created in, the, in this master branch. And then so on and so forth. This, this happens you know, over multiple days. So day two, it'll be released 1.5. Day three, it'll be released 2.0. And then eventually you know, the, horde, the horde job, the cleaning job will be finished and you'll have a completed project. So hopefully that kind of like, helped a little in conceptualizing you know what i'm about to talk about um that's has to do with um the workflow so um now coming back to software so if you have a project let's say i'm going to use a team project in school a class project all right um I gave an example in the previous talk about students using a capstone project, creating a, a capstone project. Uh, there'll be three different team members on that team and you know they'll have one branch called the master branch, which will include the um, different updates on that branch. Anytime, um, so what the workflow does is, you know, there's a master branch and a develop branch. Develop branch, um, quite obviously, well, I think it's obvious, it, it basically branches off the master branch to have um, working updates added to the code base. So anytime you know, you're on a website um, and you make a code change, uh, oh, never mind. Anytime you make a code change and create a commit, um, you basically, um, working on develop. Master branch will ideally have all clean code, all working code, ideally bug free, and you just work off of develop. So um, various teammates will have their own forks and um, within those forks, um, they'll be working on their own updates and pushing to the develop branch. The develop branch collects all the updates from the various forks or you know, branches and eventually summarizes all those updates to a release. So in this case, the master branch starts with one initial commit I named right here, OG, and the develop branch created a, a copy of that initial commit. So an update was made to the develop branch, this is the second commit, and after that update, we decided, all right, um, it's time to create a release. So with that update that was made on develop, you basically pushed that to the release branch. And this one commit commit, this one commit that is under the release 1.0 branch summarizes all the updates that were made on develop. And now it's in master. Um, so I see a question here. I'm gonna, try and answer um, it says i commit every day and it updates and i can see that i pushed it on github but my meter that tracks how often i push doesn't update like home screen on the page doesn't show my commit only when i go to a specific repository um so i think i'll need a little more clarification on that so the way um i can kind of address that actually later on in the talk um, but yeah, I think I'll need more clarification. Um, Git tracks a specific branch to what goes in the updates, to goes, that shows um, what's in those green dots, which I'm pretty sure this person is asking. Um, on your profile, you usually have green dots. And it only tracks, these, these green dots only update based on one specific branch in the code base. So um, hopefully, um, there's no questions. Hopefully it kind of makes sense. Um, 
this is really the meat of workflow and um you know i, I don't see any questions so i'm assuming this makes sense all right so i'm gonna kind of give an example of a a live example i guess of this how this works um, so like i said i created a project before and um i called it super cool project all right cool um now let's say this is not my repository this is some random repository i found on github um actually let's just go to a random repository it is actually one of my favorite um open source projects that um these are actually one of my favorite open source projects that I uh, frequent a lot is um, Mapbox GL native for Android. So if you don't know, Mapbox is a mapping software, similar to Google Maps, um, except this is open source. And um, so I'll, I'll create a fork of this. Now, what a fork is, is basically, you know, you're on, you see a repository on GitHub like such. I haven't forked this yet, so this is not updated to show like a fork. Um, and if you click fork, it creates a copy of this repository on your personal GitHub account. So a fork is a literal copy of a project, a repository. So if someone was to come to this project, this super cool project that I created and fork it, they'll have a copy of all the branches, all the commit histories, Anything that was done on this Git repository will be cloned to your personal profile on GitHub or whatever platform you use to host your code. In this case, I forked the um, Mapbox GL native to my profile. So as you see here, it says forked from Mapbox to me, to my profile. Um, okay. Um, so now I have access to all this information, all the branches that are created, all the tags, all the commits, all that. And once you create a fork, you can clone this repository. Um, I, going back to this super core project, let me, I don't wanna clone this project specifically for an example, because uh, this might be a massive <laughs> download. So I, I'm gonna just have, um, people take my word that, um, you know, we can clone, use, uh, I'm gonna show an example of how to clone. And uh, so basically you, you have access to the repository, you click the clone or download. Some people that are not familiar with Git will probably, type, will probably download zip, but you can copy this URL, copy, if you have GitHub installed in your computer, you type git clone and the URL. Okay, just one sec. Yeah, okay. Um, so I kind of jumped ahead of my own slides here. Uh, funny. So yeah, this is a scenario of, you know, you wanting to contribute to your team or open source project. So now that we forked the repository, you know, now I'm showing how to clone. Um, um, and once you clone, you can make changes and submit a pull request to the original um, repository. Uh, yeah, kind of. Okay. So back to the terminology, git clone URL. So it clones a remote repository to a computer and including all associated git data. Okay. So that's what I typed out in my terminal here. Um, to kind of go back, um, I basically had um, uh, this project already on my computer, so it makes no sense for me to really clone it here. Um, once you clone a project, the home folder, uh, actually, I'll just clone. Uh, 
There you go. Okay, clone. I see a question. So the fork for each person while the branch is for everyone. Um, I don't think that made much sense. Can you can you uh clarify that question? So the fork is for each person while the branch is for everyone. Um uh yeah, all right. I think I know what you're asking. So a fork is a literal copy, it includes all branches. A branch is just a subset of work that is tied to a Git repository. Um, so if you fork a repository, it will have a copy of the branch. So branches are for everyone, period. A fork is an action that basically creates a copy of the profile on uh, of the repository on your own personal Git repository. Um, so hopefully that answered. So the difference between forking and cloning is fork basically copies, um, it's a clone on the hosted repository. So in this case, the hosted repository is GitHub. So you're forking, you're creating a copy on GitHub if your computer doesn't know about it. Cloning creates that copy on your computer. So now it's on your computer, your computer, you know, obviously knows about it. So those are the two differences. Okay, so um, I basically cloned the super cool project to my computer, which I already had um, on my computer, but I just wanted to illustrate that point um, that if you type out git clone and the URL copied from the clone or download folder, um, it will create that, that folder. So if you type out um, the folders that were cloned, you see the super cool project. And you can navigate into that and see all the files inside there. Yada yada. Okay. Okay. So, so let's say you're right. We cloned the repositories. Uh, we cloned the repository. Um, so what's next? Basically, we're going to make some changes. You know, we cloned the repository. We're going to want to create a feature branch as following the workflow standard. We're going to create a feature branch to do some work on the code base and create a pull request to update the master code base. So to create a different branch, you basically type git checkout dash B and the branch name. Um, so the changes, uh, so this, this dash B changes your local git repository to switch to a, a new branch named branch name. Okay. So we'll do that here. All right, so I wanna create a new, get a new branch. Get checkout dash B is an, is an option that Git recognizes as create a new branch. And the branch name, we'll call it feature A. Feature A, feature dash A. It doesn't matter what you name your branches. Um, uh, I'm sure Git has some specific uh, rules for you know what characters are allowed for branches and whatnot. So I'm pretty sure you can't name a branch an emoji. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you can, but um, pretty sure you can't. <laughs> so I created a branch called Feature A. All right. Now I'll switch to the branch Feature A on my local computer. So I can make changes to the code base now. I have um, my feature branch created. And if you remember, this is my fork. Well, let's change this now. I created my fork feature A. Cool. <laughs> I created my fork and I cloned on my local repository. So now I have a copy of everything that you see here on the master branch up until, you know, obviously this um, commit right here. So um, we're just pretending that these other dots don't exist yet. We're pretending these don't exist yet. These are commits um, represented on a timeline. So I'm blocking this out for now, okay. Um, so I cloned it, and this is where I'm at right now on my local computer, feature A. 
All right, so I'm gonna make a change. Um, I have this open on my code editor. It does not look updated. Let's add a link. All right, by the way, this is a React project. Um, again, I used to work with React, but um, only reason I'm using it now on this example is because I feel like most students might be more familiar with React. But me personally, I'm kind of out of my element. So um, hopefully you guys can relate to what you see on the screen. <laughs> Sorry, so I made my change. Um, basically, um, this is just a, a blank web page. If you've ever created a, a React project from scratch, it will just have an empty screen. Let's see if I can start it actually. Oh, cool, it works. Yeah, live demos usually never go your way, so. Let's see, we're starting the page, cool. All right, so while that's loading, I basically made a change to create a link, all right? The link would be, should work here. Let's remove that, I remove all the text. So that's, that's gonna be my change now. <laughs> cool. All right, I made that change. I'm gonna start running the app. And obviously since I made that change, it basically um, removed all text on the page and now you're just left with this spinning React logo. So I wanna commit that change using git commit dash M with the message name. Um, I kind of went over that in the previous video. Um, so this is good to know your um, basics. So git commit dash M with a commit message. So git commit, um, I'll type a message, removed all text. Oops, I forgot to add, I have the Always add your changes, git add, and I'll do a git commit, move the text. Cool, I made a change to my feature branch. Now I wanna make this change visible on my, um, my project. And the way you do that is with a git push command. One sec, uh, git push command. Okay, so you know, you added the change, to your, um, your stash area. Uh, you added the change to your working area and you committed what that change does. So you're basically gonna do a git push origin. Um, origin is the name of the remote branch and the name of the branch itself. Git push origin feature A. Okay, so now if you go on GitHub, you see, oh cool, GitHub is all reactive now. It knew I created the branch, so it's telling me that um, my change was made. So I created my change with the commit message, removed all text, okay? So, all right, I made my change. We're gonna move ahead on the timeline. And this change right there um, illustrates the, the commit I did, which was remove all text. All right, removed all text. So now it basically doesn't exist on the um, develop branch or the master branch. Um, so the, the way I want to, the way you get this local change to the develop branch is you create a pull request. A uh, pull request is basically a is basically asking permission to merge your changes to the um, update to the repository. So I made my change. It's you know I was saying on feature A, and I want to merge this into develop branch. If this was a remote repository, no. Yeah. So let's create a, a pull request. Okay, so I want to merge feature A 
um, you you type out a, descript a descriptive title. Okay, and some, I don't know, some text there describing what you did. So again, um, it's asking to merge feature A into the develop branch. The a pull request is, again, asking permission to merge into a branch. If this was a fork like I did, you know, I illustrated earlier in the video of my clone for Mapbox Android, um, if I wanted to make a change, I can do whatever I want on my own fork. I can merge, I can make updates, I can push to this, but it doesn't exist on Mapbox's actual GitHub until I submit a pull request to, to their um, code base. And if you take a look at you know, their GitHub, you see the tabs on top, um, issues and then pull requests, if you click on pull requests, you see there's like there's six active pull requests. And these are various things. Pull requests doesn't have to be a code change. It can be an update to maybe a wiki. You know, if you browse through their code base, they have some pages here. Contribute, license, read me. If you made a change to this, um, that would trigger a pull request. Okay, so I'm asking to update my develop branch with the changes that I made in feature branch. All right, so I'll create a pull request. Cool. And as you see, GitHub actually illustrates that and tells you what this pull request is. I want to merge one commit from um, into develop from feature A. Okay. Now, obviously, since I own all this code, you know, this is my own repository and stuff, I can just straight up merge it into develop branch if I wanted, but obviously I am trying to illustrate um, a example to the viewers. So um, I will take this merge request and this pull request and merge it in. So I'm gonna accept it and merge pull request. Okay, it'll ask you for your information. Um, your email associated with your Git account and merge it. Okay. The pull request successfully merged and closed. So all this happened on GitHub. The, your, your local computer doesn't know what changed in the Git repository. For all, it know, for all you know, all your computer knows is that you made a change and you pushed it up to the feature A branch. So how can you know, how can you let your computer know the changes that was made on the remote repository. Okay, so if you take a look at the commit history, I feel like I'm clicking a bit too fast. Um, so again, I merged feature A into develop and you can see in the commit history, all right, that um, I successfully merged my branch into develop. Merge pull request, remove all text. Okay. So if I was to take this, if I was to change branches using git checkout develop, the git checkout um, command switches branches and it also creates branches. So as you saw earlier, git checkout, the dash B and branch name are optional. Um, no, the dash B is optional, sorry. So you do git checkout branch name. In this case, I want to check out develop. So I did that, git checkout develop. Um, if I was to try and run this project, it would still have the text on the local React app. Let's see if this updates actually. Okay, so this is develop branch right now. If you remember the changes I made, remove this text. But again, my local computer doesn't know about the remote changes that happen on GitHub. So to make that change happen, you do what's called a git pull. It, it follows the same syntax as um, the git push command. So git pull name of remote and name of branch. All right, it pull downloads updates from GitHub and push updates 
remote repository with the changes you had. So if I do a git pull origin develop and run this app again, you'll see the app is changed. There you go. So now um, the changes are made. It matches the remote repository. Um, any questions so far? No questions. All right. Seems like I'm doing a good job. Um, so there are two different PRs someone asked. Um, so this is a PR I actually created uh, before um, this video as a um, example. This is unrelated to what happened in this video just now. But yeah, it was just a did or does. So you can ignore that. A pull request only happens, you know, once per it only happens when the user, you know, specifies. So it, when I created my pull request, it didn't just magically create two pull requests. It, I just did this earlier. And um, as you see, the time it was created was yesterday. So, um, so another question, will you have to make multiple pull requests for each repository? Uh, it depends on what you mean. Um, so if you say each repository, usually when you fork a repository, you know, in my case, the map, map box um, repository, I'm referencing this specific repository on Mapbox itself. So if I create a pull request for this repository, it's because I made a change on my local repository on GitHub, and I want to reflect that change on the Mapbox um, code base. So that's when you would create a pull request. Because any change I make on my local fork or on my local computer, GitHub does not know about it until you, you know, specify. And that usually is done with a um, pull request. Someone asked, um, I created Mapbox. So the PR represents changes you want to make on your local fork Mapbox. Um, no, I didn't create Mapbox. Um, I created a fork, right? Um, so um, I created a fork of that Mapbox repository. The PR that I create will be on Mapbox's profile, not on my profile. So my profile profile is okay. So I make a change here. Um, and I update, I update locally. I pushed it to my own branch here, whatever branch. Um, if I want that change to be reflected in Mapbox, I create a pull request on Mapbox. And it will have an option on of my own, you know, repository. It will have an option of master gamer slash branch name, you know, um, wants to merge into Mapbox slash branch name. And it will have, you know, the various options um, to make that happen. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so there are two different PRs. I mean, the one we create to merge branches and the other to update our local repo. Um, I probably lost track of that um, <laughs> question that this person asked before. Um, if you can re-ask that, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, so I went over the pushing to our local, I went over the pull request. Okay, so um, let's say you're working on a feature, all right? Someone else joins the project, all right? Her name is Karina. She clones the repo and let's go with feature B. All right, she starts right here. Cool. All right, there's whatever change she cloned or forked and she made an update. 
okay? She, um, she wants to merge this into develop, but she would need to create a pull request. But there was a change in develop, this change right here uh, in, the, in between the change she made. So if you see, if I was like, copy that, there's a change here that she does not have in her local repository. So what, what happens in that case? Basically, you will need to, again, pull the latest updates. If you were to create a pull request with changes that are not in a remote repository, uh, Git will complain. Git and GitHub will complain and say, you know, your, your branch is not up to date. They'll complain and say, you know, you need to update, uh, you need to do a Git pull of the latest changes. Uh, okay. Let me see if this is clean. If it's not. I thought I had an example. I think that's why I created this pull request yesterday, but uh, Actually, I don't want to spend time um, creating that pull request. Um, okay, so so yeah, if if um, Karina makes a change and it, there's an update on the develop branch that she does not have, if she were to create a pull request, Git will GitHub will complain and say you need to pull the latest changes, and to mitigate any sort of like merge conflicts, if you're not aware of what a merge conflict is. It basically is when you are trying to download a change from a repository and it's a file that you and someone else is working on at the same time. So if I do this, okay, whatever branch this is, develop. I'm just going to illustrate a point here. Okay. Let's see if this creates a merge conflict. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of typing, but um, I'm, I'm just trying to um, create a change that will illustrate this point real quick. Of, um, gets, you can ignore this. All right, cool. Um, so let's say I made a change to, um, again, um, I made a change, oh, Karina's made a change on her branch and I did a git pull of the latest changes. All right. So this file that I was working on, app.js, was a file that was changed in the remote repository. Again, I don't have those changes because I didn't pull. So once you pull, it, it creates what's called a merge conflict. And it basically is telling you that the same thing in the same file was changed. So some code was changed and Git doesn't know how to merge these peacefully. So what you need to do is um, merge them on your own. You have to figure out what are the latest changes you wanna keep in your repository and which one you wanna um, do away with. In this case, I'm using Visual Studio Code. So it basically is, is a nice layout of how to, um, solve these merge conflicts. So you can accept the current change. And my current change was um, removing, you know, it was the same as developed. It was removing all the links and text um, and leaving only the logo. And I can accept the incoming or I can accept the incoming change. So I'll accept the incoming change because, you know, I want to match develop. Um, did I merge develop? Okay. Uh, okay, so for some reason that didn't work. 
Okay, so um, it, once I resolve the merge conflict, um, it will basically highlight and get that you made a change. All right, I made a change to the app.js file. Any change you make, you, you have to add that to the working area and also commit it. Okay. And I can now push this to the master branch, push origin master. So it's git push, remote name, branch name. Okay. And now you see that change reflected on master. Here you go, removed all text. Uh, wait. Yeah, okay. Okay. So now that you see, is this master? Doesn't look like it updated. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, I know what happened. I, I created, um, I fixed the merge conflict and basically it just updated master. Previously master did not have the changes on develop and these changes were on develop. So again, I, I pulled the changes from develop locally, fixed the merge conflict and pushed it. So I was confused for a second because I said the changes were made 14 minutes ago when I literally did it, you know, a minute ago, but um, Git saves your commit history. So the change was actually created, you know, about 14 minutes ago. So once I push that change, it, it reflects that change um, correctly. Okay. Um, I, one more thing I wanted to illustrate. This is the last, um, the last change I wanted to um, illustrate is, so in a case where, Karina is working on something and she hasn't worked in, she hasn't worked on the project in a few months. It'll be a commit all the way out here. Let's remove this. So it's not confusing. Okay. She hasn't made a change in months. All right. And basically all this stuff was happening while she was, I don't know, on vacation or something. And you know, she made changes locally that obviously no branch is aware of, all these branches. Okay. She hasn't been pulling this whole time because it's always good cop it's always good practice to pull changes um, that you think may have happened at any time during um, your development. So as you see all these arrows, there's arrows pointing up to various commits. These are updates to commits. Okay, so she's been working on this stuff and here's the scenario. All right, you wanna keep local changes that you made and match the remote updates. So the command I'm just gonna illustrate um, is the git stash command. So git stash is, um, I mean, it's straightforward. It's, it stashes your changes that you've made locally. Um, away into the stash area. So the stash is basically a stack. So if you're familiar with data structures, it's, you know, what is it, first in last out kind of data structure that basically stashes commits in and takes the latest out whenever you pop. Um, if you don't know what a, um, a, a stack is, um, let me know. Uh, it's quite easy to explain, but um, you know, I'm assuming you guys know what a stack is. So um, yeah, you do a git stash, um, then you pull, and then you do a git stash pop. So if you want to stash changes, um, let's say you know I've made my change to this app.js file again. Uh, let's say I want to add a second header, copy, paste. Okay. All right, cool. I made this change. I added another header, which is another logo. All right, so you do a git stash. You don't have to specify anything. You can do a just type git stash and type enter. All right, cool. 
Now it just undid my local change. So if I do a git stash pop, it would re-add the change that I made locally. So again, I want the latest, I want the latest code from develop branch. Um, Karina wants the latest code from develop branch and she hasn't been pulling from the code base in a long time. All right, yada, yada, yada. I made this change here. And I look at the master repository and for some reason I can't push because I haven't updated. So I'm a stash, get stash. And then you would do like a git pull from the branch that you wanna pull from. In this case, based on the diagram, it'll be the develop branch. Um, in this case, actually it won't do nothing. All right, cool, yeah. Um, so once you pull the latest changes, you can do a git stash pop and it will re-add the local changes that you already made to whatever updates came from the remote repository. So once you pull, it updates your local repository to match whatever's on the remote repository. And Stash basically takes the changes you worked on locally and apply that to your local code base. Okay. Um, okay, and you know, these are just other options that I am not going to go over actually. Um, so with um, get stash, um, when you stash it, you can list out the different um, stashes that you've done. Get stash, let me clear, all right. You do, you can type get stash list and it'll list out all the stash um, changes that you made. Um, so basically it's showing you the stack. Um, and this is pretty gibberish, but this was the latest change that I made in my, in my stash um, stack. And I kind of had um, in the slide here, the option to do the dash save descriptive text. Um, option. So instead of having gibberish, you could type git stash save with um, a descriptive um, a descriptive text. All right. Oops, I put two dashes as one. Uh, there's no dash. There you go. All right. So if I type the get stash list again, you'll see that instead of the gibberish that was there before, it will basically have the descriptive text here. So there's times when you stash a lot. There's a lot of changes that you made locally that you want to add later because you want to work on a feature that you know happened in a remote repository but you just don't have time to complete the work you did. So you basically stash it and just update your local repository to match the remote repository. Okay. And actually that is all I was going to go over today. All right. So um, basically, again, so given the rundown of everything that happened, hopefully you had an idea of how to, of what open source is and how it's beneficial to you as a student and even as a, a current worker, like open source is important to me. And, you know, as you've seen in my example with the Mapbox um, Android code base, um, I actually referenced that a lot and um, it helps you learn a lot about different code standards. Um, Hopefully, um, through viewing this, you also learn how to clone a Git repository. You also know what a uh, Git workflow is, and um, you have an understanding of some more advanced Git commands and terminology. And hopefully, you know how to navigate GitHub altogether. Um, so I believe that pretty much wraps up the um, presentation.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart, for this informative um, webinar. And if students do have additional questions, how can they get in contact with you? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so I actually had a contact me slide. You can always reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I'm pretty responsive. So um, any questions, you can just hit me up there. And my informal channels, you can also add me on Instagram. This is actually one of my photography pages. I need more followers. So, you know, there's my chance to um, self-promote here. <laughs> and I'm also working on an Android app. Um, that is in beta testing. So um, I'm actually I'm actually looking for actual testers that we're gonna do a questionnaire on. So if you have an Android device, and it's New York City only, so I'm actually was pretty made aware that um, not only New York City students are viewing this, but um, you know, um, if you want to help me test out my app, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and uh, you can get in contact with me. So awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, and like he said, make sure you follow him on his channels, connect um, on LinkedIn. And again, thank you guys so much for tuning in um, this evening. And I hope you guys have a wonderful one. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, everyone.